there are a few different ways to which, by which you can connect the pump suction to a tank. One is with an elbow, another would be with a slanted pipe, which is a half elbow, you might say, and another would be with a pipe sticking straight through. So the elbow has a, a, a big advantage in the sense that, as you can see, the bottom of the elbow is lower, so that we're getting bigger, some greater submergence. Hopefully, we'll avoid vortexing, and we'll have a better chance of avoiding vortexing. And also, we'll be able to empty that tank much to a much greater depth than otherwise. Of course, the slanted is a compromise, and the straight end would be the most economical. So I've seen all three, and the elbow is um, it's, it's quite predominant in certain industries, especially industries where if you have a shutdown you need to get rid of that product and treat it in some fashion environmentally. This allows you to drain down the tank to a very low level. But areas where we come into problems when we install pumps is when, we, when the air is too tight, we have to put it in a pump with an elbow that's close to the, uh, to the suction to the eye of the impeller. This can cause problems because if we have an elbow coming in very close to the suction, we're going to have large-scale turbulence and that's not going to be good for the pump. As, we, as the fluid gets through the eye with this turbulence, it'll make the pump behave not, not as well as it would otherwise. So try to avoid having the elbow too close to the suction and uh, just, just try to get a nice straight piece of pipe a uh, good distance before the elbow to promote a good, nice, uh, even, even flow into the pump. Now, there's a lot of, uh, people have all kinds of ideas about pump suctions. Usually what you'll hear is a pump suction should be as short as possible, should be of a really good size, reasonable size, at least the pump suction size, maybe one diameter above. All this is very good, but what I can tell you is that um, I've seen pump, su pump suctions that are miles long. In the mining industry, they have pumps that are uh, stages of pumps that pump into each other two miles down the road. So it's not about the length, is it? It's about coming into a pump with a nice uniform flow with no large-scale turbulence and sufficient pressure to make the pump operate properly. Now, if we have a larger pipe than we, a pump, than the pump suction, we need to get in there with some sort of reducer. There's obviously a couple of options. One is to be flat on top, other is to be flat on bottom, and the other is in between, which is concentric. My preference is flat on top, and the reason is because if there's air in the liquid, the air will stay on the top or will, will navigate its way through on the top, go through the pump and get out of the system. If we're flat on the bottom, it's going to have more difficulty doing that because it's got to go down into the pump, so it'll tend to stay at that level in the suction. You won't, it won't be difficult to get rid of it. Of course, the concentric uh, is somebody who really couldn't quite make up their mind. So, the, the last thing I want to talk to you about sort of fittings and, and uh, protective equipment around pumps is rupture discs. Uh, rupture disc is the, is the safety uh, uh, apparatus that uh, it's made up of a plate that is engineered to burst open if the pressure gets too high. So um, cases such as mining where we have uh, several stages, if there's an obstruction in the line, this means that the pump will, uh, will have no floor or, or zero flow. When there's no flow in a centrifugal pump, the head goes up and the pressure goes up, which means that it can get quite high. And if you have several pumps in series, that's cumulative. So three pumps, that means that the pressure will go up three times as high. And therefore, you could damage the equipment, the pumps, the pipes, uh, you name it. So uh, it's, it's a common practice to put in a rupture disc. There's a wonderful piping uh, gizmo called a Venturi, <clears throat> which is really just a pipe that goes to a smaller pipe. Um, what happens is when we do this, when we push fluid from a large pipe to a smaller pipe, we get a reduction in pressure. It's rather amazing when you think of it. Uh, this pressure can be reduced so much as to become less than atmospheric so that you have suction happening right after the reduction. How does this work? Well, I've tried to come up with the analogies to, to, to to, to explain this phenomenon, and the, the best one I've found up to now, I think, is to compare the, uh, the pipe and the fluid and the restriction to a cyclist going uh, from a high level to a low level. Now, these images are not very clear, I know, and um, uh, we'll see them individually in a second, but uh, 
what we're seeing is one on top of the other. We have the cyclist and the venturi below. So what happens in a venturi is that the pressure and the flow is forced into a smaller conduit. Something has got to, uh, got to give. The, the flow that comes to the smaller conduit has to accelerate or go faster because we're pushing the same amount of liquid through there. So to compensate for this increase in speed, the pressure goes down. It's a question of conservation of energy. We've reduced, um, we've uh, increased the speed energy, the velocity, at the expense of the pressure. The same thing happens to a cyclist. If he's on the top of the hill, he's got zero velocity, and as soon as he goes down, his velocity increases. So at the top of the hill, he has what's termed uh, potential energy or, or elevation energy, right? And as he lets himself go down, that elevation energy drops or reduces and his, his velocity energy increases. So the same thing happens within the, within the pipe, although we're talking about two different types of energy. One is pressure energy that is reduced at the, uh, causing or the velocity energy to, or to increase or the velocity to increase. So you can see these, uh, these little, um, I've used these before for experiments, these little uh, venturis are available uh, uh, probably a lot of places. I found mine on, uh, on a website uh, by Fisher Scientific. It's called a Nalgene aspirator and this is what it looks like. Um, the horizontal connection at uh, the one end is connected to your tap. The uh, straight through part is, this, uh, the, is the discharge. and. If you have a flow and pressure of water from your tap, you'll see that you'll get an aspiration from the side, which is exactly because the venturi is causing a low pressure to occur at that point, so that it wants to suck in air from, from that point. So I'll actually use this in an experiment later that I'll show you. How are pipes sized in systems? Well, there's some um, guidelines, generally speaking. So on the discharge side, we want the liquid to move rather a bit more quickly. Uh, we, won't, we don't want the pipe size to be unnecessarily large for, for nothing. So a good guideline is somewhere between 9 feet per second and 12 feet per second. I mean, it could, could be less, it could be more for various reasons. Obviously, uh, somebody could do an economic analysis of the pipe size versus the amount of friction it causes. So if it's, uh, if it's very small, there'll be a lot of friction, the pump will have to be bigger, that's costly. If the pipe size is very large, then the power can be less, and so there's a trade-off. But between those two uh, figures, typically that's where the pipe size uh, will, be, uh, will, will turn out to be. So if you have the velocity and uh, you have the flow rate, you can figure out the, the, the diameter. On the suction, usually we'd like to be a little bit slower, maybe between three and six, but again, this is entirely uh, variable. That's just a starting point. Uh, very often, we'll wind up being approximately one diameter, pipe size diameter, above the size of the suction. But again, it depends on the specific situation. So a few words on terminology. Uh, in pump systems, we talk a lot about head, and um, the nice thing about head is that it's really a dimension. So we have total static head, which represents the head between the liquid surface of the suction tank and the liquid surface of the uh, discharge tank. These can be broken into two components, one being the suction head, so between the liquid surface and the uh, suction of the pump, or discharge head between the liquid sur uh, sorry, the discharge, uh, the suction of the pump and the liquid surface of the discharge. The difference between those two is the total static head. Now the head, if the pump, if the pipe end is submerged at the discharge side, we take the head between li two liquid surfaces and not to the end of the pipe because we've got to follow that liquid from one end to the other. All those fluid particles have to get from the top of the suction tank to the top of the discharge. The last term, uh, well not the last, but one very important term is total head. Total head will be the sum of the total static head, so how far you have to pump from down below to, to up, and friction head. Friction head is the amount of friction loss there is for a fluid going through a pipe. So it will depend on the velocity, on the pipe size, on the type of fluid, if, if it's uh, viscous or not, if it's water or some, something else. 
and you can find this uh, the the value of friction head based on those factors in various ways. Uh, there are tables, uh, there are formulas to calculate it. So it's not not very complicated to get that number. You just have to know where to find it. So if you add those two, static head and uh, friction head, you get total head, which is the amount of energy that the pump is going to need to have for a specific flow rate.